you walk into the back entrance of Bolter Hall on the UCLA campus, you may notice a seemingly random pattern of floor tiles in the entrance. If you spend a little time looking at the pattern, it might dawn on you that the tiles represent zeros and ones, and then you might even figure out that the tiles represent ASCII characters. The characters in the floor tiles spell out low and behold, to commemorate the building where L and O were the first two packets ever sent on the ARPANET from UCLA to Stanford Research Institute on October 29, 1969. ARPA wanted a network so that they could share the large computing resources they had given to their researchers across the country. University of Utah had a terrific graphics operating system. SRI had database, we had simulation, University of Illinois had high, high performance computing. And every time ARPA brought on a new researcher, they'd offer to buy him a computer, fine, but the researcher would say, I want the same capability all those other guys have. I want the graphics, the database, and all the rest. And ARPA said, we can't afford that. <clears throat> if you want to do graphics, you log on to the machine at Utah through a network that we think we're going to make. So the need for the network was to do resource sharing and not to protect the United States against a nuclear holocaust. When Bob Taylor came in as the NEC director, and he recognized his need for sharing resources, by the way, notice the phrase I'm using, sharing resources is exactly what I built into the network design. Now they wanted to share the external resources. Same idea. You have it, you're not using it, somebody else you'll be able to. So they brought in Larry Roberts, another classmate of mine, in fact, an officer mate of mine at MIT, to manage this project. He came to me because he knew my work. He, he watched me do the simulation. In fact, I used his compiler on the TX2 computer and said, Len, we need to know if this thing is going to work. He knew that I had the th theory, so I could show it to him it's going to work. In fact, he even says he would never have decided to spend millions of dollars of the US government's money if he wasn't sure this thing would work. So the design began to be laid out by a few of us in 1967. In 68, they sent out a request for a proposal. The end of 68, both Baranek and Newman, a Cambridge, Massachusetts firm, won the contract to produce the first switch of the ARPANET. And we became the network measurement center early on so we could test it out. During the design phase, some great people were there throwing their ideas out. Herb Baskin was there, a time sharing expert. And he said, if this network can't deliver short messages within a half a second, I can't use it for time sharing. Right. Specification, exactly. half a second. By the way, we got 200 milliseconds. <laughs> it came along. <laughs> and uh, Wes Clark said, separate computer from communications. I said, look, if this is going to be an experiment, and I was also interested in the research and the experimentation, we have to build software in so we can run experiments artificial traffic generators, measurement hooks, a place where the measurements can be evaluated, put that software in. So Howie Frank began to talk about <clears throat> network reliability. He said this network, if anything fails, the network shouldn't collapse. So we built in a, we, so we didn't say there should be five nines of uptime. We went much more pragmatic. We said if any single thing fails, everybody else can still talk. So to do that, you need something called a two-connected topology, two independent pairs between every pair of nodes. Built in it. So all those specs went to BBN. They built the darn thing. They delivered the switch here at UCLA on schedule. Eight months after they got the contract, they were to deliver this new technology, new applications, new device. They did it on time, on budget. It came here. We plugged it in. And bits began to move back and forth between our timeshare machine and that switch on the day after Labor Day, September 2nd, 1969. Wow. But that was just a one-node network. <clears throat> the schedule was that another one of these switches would be delivered at Stanford Research Institute, 400 miles to the north. And they would connect that to their machine. And that happened in October. So in October, we had a two-node network. M my machine, my switch. Another switch, 400 miles away, and the SRI host. Okay. And it wasn't one single line. It was a gang of 4.8 kilobit per second lines. So now what do you do? You have a two-node network. Well, now you can do something. So we decided one night, one night late in October, 
programmer, Charlie Klein, and I were in the room and said, look, let's, let's communicate between the two machines. So we got a hold of Bill Duval, their programmer up there, and we said, let's simply log in from a terminal connected to our host to that machine. The idea is these are both time-sharing systems. They expect terminals to connect in and use the services of the machine. The big thing was sit at a terminal here, log onto your machine here, and through this wonderful network, log on here as if you're a local user. Well, that's easy enough. <laughs> so we got all set, got Charlie down at the terminal over here, and just to be sure this worked, we had a telephone handset. In fact, I actually think I've got the, so here it is. <laughs> I'm just happy to have it. That was a telephone set. That's the telephone handset. That was the telephone. We plugged it in. We, we, dero we derived a. Uh, you weren't using uh, Skype. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> plugged it in. We used a piece of the high speed line for the, for the phone connection. But what the interesting thing is, we were using the defunct circuit switching technology to prove out the new packet switching technology. Right. And it really helped us yeah. so we could understand what's going on. So Charlie typed the L and we said, you get the L? Bill said, yep, got the L. Typed the O, you get the O? We're trying to do L-O-G for login. Get the O, got the O. Type the G, get the G, crash. So the first message ever on the network was low, as in lo and behold. Now that's especially interesting because if you go outside this hallway here down into the alley and come into another entrance to this building, and you, I just discovered this about a week ago, you, you walk on, on a platform and there's a mosaic of tiles down there. And they're a strange pattern. It turns out it's the ASCII code for lo and behold. I have no idea who did that. You know, it's about a year and a half now. Some very clever person put that in. That was the first message, October 29th, 1969, at 10.30 at night. You're entering 1969 right now. We reproduced this room to look as it did and smell and feel like it did some 40 odd years ago. And if you look over here, you're looking at the first piece of equipment ever on the internet. This is that first interface message processor, imp number one at UCLA, a Honeywell mini computer adapted by Bolt Baranek and Newman, BBNN, to operate as a switch and channel to open the functionality. And uh, this is the same physical four square feet where it served as the opening note of the internet. First piece of equipment ever on the internet. And that's the actual one. That's it. I kept it for years. They tried to throw it away many times. Most of the people who had imps have tossed them. There's just the one or two left around the world. But this is number one. This is the first piece. If you open this machine, you'll be privileged to smell it. Yeah. It's got an unusual odor and just brings you right back. Yeah. You know, emotionally, it's great. You can't smell it through this. This is a military hard machine. This, this machine was essentially a state-of-the-art mini-computer, which was adapted by BBNN. And I first saw it in 1968 at one of the joint computer conference shows. Thousands of people on the big, big exhibit floor. And you see these sky hooks up here? They had one of these machines hanging from the, from the ceiling, swinging in the air, running. And there was a guy, big guy, <laughs> stripped to the waist, oil skin with a sledgehammer. And he was going whack, right. whack, to show that it was, it was military. military. <laughs> and it was. <laughs> but the most important document of the internet, the most important document of the entire internet is right here. You talked about who was working with me. Well, one of my software programmers was John Postel. In fact, here's his picture. And he was not a hippie, even though he appears to be. He was the one who basically disciplined my, my staff to do things properly and keep records. He said, we have to keep a record of what's going on. So beginning in October, basically a month after the imp arrived, we started keeping an imp log. You know, this is an engineer's log. This is not, you know, Madison Avenue piece of document. Just scribble, we use an old SDS log. And in here, 
we kept a record of what's going on. And the most important entry happened to be right here on October 29, 1969, at 10.30 at night, Charlie Klein, the programmer who's in the room with me, made this entry. Talk to SRI, host to host. This is the only record of the very first message ever on the internet, right here. You know, we had the technology. We started making measurements. We were the first experimental node. So we, we saw things happening. How come we have a 50 kilobit per second line the routing procedure either goes one way or the other, one at a time. So how can you get more than 50 kilobits per second between two nodes? If there's only one path at any time. And we say, oh, it's obvious. <laughs> that path is on now. When it gets backed up, you change paths. So this guy's emptying its pack back up while you're sending this way. And they go close to 100 kilobits per second. Right. Too. So think, and, but we could break it at will, as I said. And every time we did, we would call BBNet and say, Fix it. We did this. Fix it. Because they wouldn't give us the code. They kept it proprietary until the ARPA said, we paid for that code. You have to open it. They did. We saw it. Every time we got it, and it would take them six months to fix anything. Right. We discover a fault. This time we had the code. We showed them how to fix it. Still took six months. One of the things I was very much interested in with design was distributed control. Why? Right. When I was a student There's of Shannon, Shannon's great work came when you had a lot of things interacting, long code words, for example. That's when these emergent properties arise. So I said, I want to design large networks. Design a large network. You can't have a single point of control. You have to distribute it. Right. So what does it mean to distribute control? You're delegating authority to all the peers. When ARPA started funding the principal investigators, they had the same philosophy. They said, look, you're a smart guy, here's some money. Go do the thing you do best. We're not going to sit on top of you. Make good things happen. So here we are. I'm a recipient of that kind of money. What do I do with it? I've got my graduate students. They're brilliant kids. Look, we need a host-host protocol. Here. I'm not going to sit on top of you. I'm going to run with it. That is not a product mentality. Right. That is a research, a development, a creative mentality. And it worked so well.